Yes. Shay for five, Sway in the morning. Uh, man, we got our next guest here, Heather B. I yes. really, really admire this man. Um, this man, to me, is what a, every American uh, could, should be like or aim to be like, somebody who's dedicated his life um, to helping others after experiencing a, a, a tragedy. Um, I'm talking about the author of the book, They Call Me Mr. D, the story of Columbine's heart, resilience, and recovery, mm. um, April 20th, 1999. Um, that's when the Columbine massacre took place. It left 13 people, uh, took 13 people's lives. Frank DeAngelis um, was a part of the mourning that took place in the Columbine community. Uh, he vowed to never forget those who were murdered and dedicated his life and career to helping students, kids, uh, anybody who suffered from this to recover. He committed to staying on, on as a principal of the school to help the students in the community heal. Um, he wanted to heal his Columbine family, and he's here today, 20 years later, and he's still on the job, Heather B., and I want to salute him and welcome him to the show. Frank DeAngelis, ladies right. and gentlemen. Mr. D. Yeah. Right. Mr. D. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're a great man, Mr. D. Well, I'm, I was surrounded by great people. Surrounded by, so yeah. Uh, you talk about your upbringing, you know, a little bit about your family, man. It seemed like you had a really tight-knit family and came up in, around surrounded by a great community. It was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you can look at me and you can tell I'm full-blooded Italian. Look you know, at that uh, man right there. Yeah, look yeah. at you. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting profiled, too. I am profiled. <laughs> I'm using my hands. I may end up slapping you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so funny. Uh, when I retired, I came up to Jersey Shore, and I was with all my Italian cousins, and it was like a scene from The Soprano. So I said, this is all right, you know. But my family was so good, and I'm so blessed to have my parents still alive. They're 88 and 84, and mm-hmm. they instilled the values in me. And so... You know, when people go through tough times, the family's there, and I was so blessed. I had my family, and then, of course, the Columbine family, where it was a part of my life for 35 years. That, yeah, that, that, wow. that moment in time was, uh, for us, for all of us, was almost like a horror movie that just was reality. Yeah. Uh, that, that was even unbelievable watching it. I remember I was in California uh, when the news came out and just thinking this can't be real, like this, not here, not in this country. And since then, I mean, we pulled up at least – 50 um, uh, massacre, shooting massacres that we've seen on different college campuses, malls, uh, so on and so forth since then. And it seemed like it's gotten worse in this country. Uh, what is you're on the ground, your boots to the ground. What are you what are you sensing? I see the same thing. But one of the things I'm the type of person, I'm never going to be helpless and hopeless. Yeah. And I'm going to continue to fight until the day I can't walk or talk and I'm not giving up hope and you know, the thing that I do make no mention of when I get an opportunity to speak is we continue to hear about it, but how many have been stopped because of things we're doing differently. Okay. And I think that's so important. Back in the day, uh, 1999, the only drills we did were fire drills. Okay. And, I mean, how many kids have lost their lives to fires or staff members? But now, I mean, these kids are doing drills, and it's not to make them afraid. But what you're pointing out, I mean, these things are happening in churches. It's happening in schools. It's happening all over. And we just need to say, as Americans, as human beings, we got to say enough's enough. This is this is not working, man. Our kids are our most precious commodity. What, what do you think, you know, being on the ground, being hands-on? Like we, we were talking about earlier today, we told a story of how in New Zealand, right after the Christchurch shootings, they banned all assault weapons, semi-automatic weapons, and then Recently in Australia, they're even attacking the Internet where they're saying uh, companies like Google or Facebook, if you post violent uh, footage, you could be fined or even jailed. Do you think those measures can help? This is a unique answer because I think what worries me is when someone comes out and says, if we eliminate this, we're never going to have another school shooting. I mean, after Columbine, they said, well, anyone that listens to Marilyn Manson may become a mass murderer, anyone that plays a game of doom, and I don't agree I think what worries me is when there are people stating that if we have outlaw guns or tougher gun laws, there's never going to be another school shooting. And uh, I'll use Columbine. They purchase guns illegally. They stop that. And what I look at is it's almost like having a jigsaw puzzle. And do we need, are there loopholes in gun laws? Yes. I mean, do we need automatic, semi-automatic weapons? We need to have sensible gun laws. But what worries me is when people don't want to talk about some of the issues our kids are dealing with, some mental health issues. We need to provide support. When I hear school districts saying we're going to cut that support for kids, that worries me. One of the things that scares me to death is social media. Mm. The role that that plays, and I know when I get to talk to parents in community, I said, you know what your kids are doing on their phones? And then you add the parenting and things of that nature. So when you put all those pieces of the puzzle, I think then we have a chance of combating some of the stuff that's happening. 
Frank DeAngelo says here, he got a book they call me Mr. Dre, the story of Columbine's heart, resilience, and recovery. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm wondering? I think it's important to have a conversation about um, the ongoing trauma that's caused from gun violence. And I'm referencing, you know, two of the Parkland shooting survivors that committed suicide recently and how what do we do right after? You mentioned mental health, but to restore and maintain good mental health for those who have suffered. You know, and one of the things we hear about the people who lose their lives that are victims of these violent crimes, but there are so many people that are impacted. I have what I call my kids. They're 37 and 38 year old adults, but they'll always be my kids and they're struggling with drug and alcohol addiction. And we need to continue mm. to provide that support because people feel that you're going to wake up some morning, it's going to get back to normal, and it doesn't. We had to redefine what normal is, and so these support systems need to be in place. What kind of things did you do for yourself, to Tracy point, right. uh, to recover psychologically and mentally? You know, one of the things that was so important, and I tell people, hopefully you never have to go through a Columbine, and there are people that have gone through more things. It's not a competition who suffers more. But I said you need to find that support system, and for me it was my family. My faith is important to me. You know, and it helped me uh, story after story that my faith journey was important and then the mental health. And I think in our country, and it scares me because there's this stigmatism that if you seek mental health, that's a sign of weakness. Uh -huh. And to me, that's a sign of strength. And I wouldn't be sitting in this studio today that if I didn't get that mental health piece that I needed, the faith in my family. It's all these components because I felt if I was going to continue to go out and rebuild that community, help future Columbine kids and kids around this country, I needed to take care of myself. If not, I couldn't help other people. Frank DeAngelis. Okay. Um, you know, outside of the school shootings, you also had like the shooting that happened in Vegas. You had the shooting that happened at the movie theater. And so I, I, I know you're you're pretty much focused on just like the Columbine incident and, and school shootings in general. But do you see any similarities with what we can do moving forward to sort of curb these incidents from happening, whether it's inside the school or outside? It's funny you should say that. I have all these bands on my arm. It's Columbine, the Vegas shootings and things of mm -hmm. this because, you know, one more death. And one more life taken is one too many. And, you know, even though I concentrate on school shootings, it's all about violent acts. And we, we've got to say enough is enough. And I have to give the kids from Parkland some credit last year when they said, basically, you adults suck. I mean, you have done nothing to protect us. And we're yeah. going gonna to make it known. And I think we need to come together and say, this has got to stop. I mean, we're taking lives on a daily basis. And one of the things that... I think we need to know is that schools are still safe and I know this statistic is a little bit dated but there are probably 300 killings each day in the United States and how many happen mm -hmm. in schools and so we have to say this violence has got to stop and we we've got to stand up and say no more that we can't accept this who are we saying it to and who are the people that can help well, well how does policy help how do our political realm help it was so interesting. Last year, I got an opportunity to meet with 65 kids from Parkland, and, I mean, they were passionate, and they were passionate, but I said, you, you know, sooner or later, the cameras are going to go away. Are you still going to have that passion? And yeah. he said, what you need to do is exactly what you're saying. What are you going to follow up with? You need to go out and vote to, you know, elect these officials that are passing these laws that are killing kids. I mean, they're not stopping us. That from killing kids and things of that nature, I said it's more, I mean, you get in front of the cameras and you're passionate, but now we have to have the follow through. 18 to 21, how many people are voting or not voting? And the elected officials are the ones that are going to make some differences. So mm -hmm. I think their voices could be heard. We're going to take your phone calls, 888-742-3345. Um, <clears throat> Frank DeAngelis is here. They call me Mr. Dre on the story of Columbine's heart. I'm excuse me, Mr. D. I'm thinking Dr. Dre. I'm sorry, man. I'll see y'all. Yeah, see we, Dr. Dre. Yeah, we get confused all the time. I know y'all do, man. Man, dude. Awesome beats. All right. <laughs> the story of Columbine's um, heart resilience and recovery. 888-742-3345. It's in the morning. Shade 4-5. Frank DeAngelis is here. He's an angel. If you look at the origin of his last name, DeAngelis, mm -hmm. somehow that makes sense. I don't know how it's going to correlate that, Frank, but you're an angel. I like the work you're doing out here. Yep. I know you don't make Harley, you don't make no money doing this work, Frank. You out here doing it for the people. Well, and, and the thing I want to let people know is any money made from the proceeds of the sales, mm -hmm. I'm donating back to three causes that are so important to me, the Columbine Memorial, that's mm -hmm. going to be there a lot longer than I am, and for all those kids who tragically lost their life, Mr. Sanders and everyone impacted. And then at Columbine, 
high school, there's a program called the Frank D'Angelo's Academic Fund, so I'm going to give money to the future Rebels. And then there's a training center that brings in SWAT team members from around the country, Navy SEALs, and that's really training them to protect us against some of the uh, awful things that are happening. So I want to give all that money back, pay it for it. Oh, man, Frank, man. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about um, teachers having uh, guns in the classroom? That's a tough one. I don't think they should have them. And I'm going to give you the reason why. Okay. I'm going to use myself as an example. When I walked out of my office that day, my worst nightmare became a reality. I am facing a gunman that's about 100 yards away, and I'm staring down the barrel of a shotgun that looked about the size of a cannon. And if I would have been carrying that day as educators, I could go out and do target practice and become efficient, but I don't know if I have the mindset to kill someone. Mm. And the person pointing a gun at me was one of my kids. And what I would have done that day is said, you know, what are you doing? Put the gun down. There's got to be a better way. And when doing that, I would have endangered those kids. I, You know, there were 20 girls that were unaware it was happening, and luckily I was able to get them to a safe place. But I would have tried to talk them down, and I just don't think educators has that. They, I don't think the educators have the mindset to shoot someone, you know, even though they can be trained. Now, I'm all for having school resource officers in buildings because one of the things we're finding out with all these events that are happening, they're usually over within 10 minutes. Yeah. And I think back to 20 years ago, Columbine, the most disheartening thing to me was a protocol that was in place. And it wasn't that the police were not brave, but they were being told that they could not go into the building until SWAT arrived. And unfortunately, it took SWAT about 50 minutes to get there. How many minutes? 50 minutes. Five, Five zero? Five zero. And so oh. if, if we had that first officer that was engaging gunfire with the two gunmen, if he would have followed in, we would not have lost 13. But the thing that's scary is these two kids were, I mean, just deviant, pure evil. And the thing that was disheartening to me is the fact that they, what they want to do is blow up the school. They placed two propane tanks about 50 feet away from each. And in the cafeteria, we had about 500 kids. If those bombs would have exploded, it would have killed five to 600 people. And unfortunately, one of the things that we, they were able to do is there was a, a book out there, an anarchist cookbook, and they learned how to make those bombs. And it was from that they were wired perfectly, but they were supposed to use metal on metal, and they used plastic. And luckily, they were bad bomb makers, or we would have lost five to 600 people. Wow. They call me Mr. D, Frank DeAngelis. Uh, it's the story of Columbine's heart, resilience, and recovery. Proceeds are going to benefit charities, so people could go online and get this book everywhere, right? Correct? Yeah, yeah it's okay. on Amazon and uh, Barnes & Noble, and it's out there. Brian is in Atlanta. Brian, good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Hey, How are you? You have a question for Frank? Yeah, well, a after y'all were just talking, I actually got two now. I just wanted to see. Uh, number one, there's a school that I'm actually involved with, with football and coaching and all that. And you know what they do is it, it all, it's also military bound, but they actually allow each student has to come in the same door every morning and shake those guys' hands. They mm. can tell if something's bad. They can see that something doesn't smell right. They can see anything about that kid approaching that school and say, hey, man, you need to tuck your shirt in. Hey, man, we need to get our stuff involved. But it's automatically giving them an idea of what's coming into their school instead of not knowing until 10 or 11 o'clock. That's interesting. But the military side of it is why I think they can do that. But I'm just thinking that that suggestion would be like, hey, man, you got a lot of faculty, staff, hands on every student coming across mm -hmm. your face. Well, and Brian, you bring up a key point. And my background before I became principal, I was a football coach, baseball coach. And to me, people talk about locks on doors, metal detectors. They talk about cameras. But to me, it's about relationships. And those kids got to feel welcome. And I think, you know, I had weaknesses as a leader. But one of my strengths, if you talk to my kids, it was a relationship that I had. And that's the thing that was so disheartening that 13 people were killed by two of my kids. And is it something we missed? you know, with those kids, because I saw these kids when they were five, six years old, smiling little kids, and I saw someone pointing a gun at me. But I think that key point that you're bringing is relationships, mm -hmm. that, that one good adult could make a difference. What is the protocol then um, for a teacher, just because we have so many teachers that listen to this show and then work in a school system, if you see something that may be a little off, and that's lack of a better word, with one of the students, do you go to the principal, do you call their parent? Like, what are you supposed to do? And this is a piece of advice for everyone listening. I know you have a great audience, and this is a good way to get this out there, large numbers out there. 
we tell our kids to see something, say something, but as adults, we need to make sure we do something. And that is so mm. important because to me, kids are the ones that are going to see this in social media. They need to be empowered to let someone know, and then the adults need to go forward. In the case that you're presenting to us, as a principal, I would get law enforcement in to just check it out. Because what worries me a lot of times is I think people will say, well, they're just kidding, they're just kidding. And I think we need to err on the side of caution to protect all of our kids. Mm -hmm. Frank, I want to thank you for coming by. Brian, by the way, thank you for the question. You're a citizen. This way in the morning. And I see Philip and Cali, Dan in New York. Um, maybe you can hit Frank up directly on his social media, guys. Like, Frank, anybody tune in. If you, you're trying to get information that you could b better make your community safe, uh, hit up Frank DeAngelis on his social, which is, what is your social? Uh, Frank. Frank Diane 72, my high school sweetheart, my beautiful wife. Frank yeah. Diane 72. She always got your back. She does. A proud graduate, 1972. I'm old. You people are young. But okay. thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all hit him up, citizens, and thank him for the work that he's doing for our kids in yes, our communities. Thank so him. Important. Hit him on his social media and thank him. Frank Diane, D-I-A-N-E, the number 72. Play in the morning. Count black.